Jesus is just moments away from his arrest. He's going to be falsely accused, tried, and crucified. He's been teaching his disciples and preparing them, but now he's praying. He has prayed for himself. He has prayed for his disciples. And next, he's praying for us. He's praying for all believers. And this famous prayer of Jesus, his last public prayer that he's praying, is for us and our unity and our love for one another. All righty, howdy, Church Project. Good morning. So good to see you. You made it through the eclipse. Hey, we're all here. You know, some crazy Christians were thinking Jesus was going to come back. They predicted the day. And I just thought, I bet some of you will still be here on Sunday. I just didn't think it'd be all of you. So uh, you made it. You made it past the rapture. I don't know if that's good or not, but I'm really glad you're here. On behalf of annoying voices everywhere, I'd like to apologize for my voice today. I'm sorry I'm sick, but I'm powering through it for you because we can't wait to get into this passage of Scripture. I'd love for you to take your Bible and turn in it to the book of John, chapter 17. While you're turning there, let me just say a couple things, please. Uh, number one, by, by the way, there's a Bible under a chair close to you. If you don't own one, we'd love to give you one before you leave today. If you can't get one for yourselves, if you own it, bring it with you. If you don't have one, somebody gladly pass one to you. John, chapter 17, feel free to use your table of contents. Uh, we had a great gathering event for women this past uh, Thursday night, I believe. Hundreds of women came. Joey, uh, one of our pastors and his team, put an incredible event together. Thank you for that. Holly Roberts spoke. It was really great. Yeah, thanks for that. If you're a lady and you missed it, I hope you can... Uh, make the next one. Or if you're a lady, buy the next one, you know, you know, these days, you can come to the next gather event. Just kidding. When I'm sick, I have freedom to make some funny jokes. Um, gather event. Hey, today, after the 11 o'clock gathering, we have a really great marriage workshop. It's for people who, um, uh, marriages, like learning how to fight. Uh, some our Christian counselors who they are based in our church they have an incredible ministry. We really love them. They'll be leading this. Some of you, we do it after church so that you get practice on the way to church of knowing what not to do. That's why I don't ride with my wife to church because I got to preach and then we would fight. And so anyway, for those of you who fought on the way to church, we have a workshop where you ride after this. If you're not signed up, we'd love for you to sign up. Just how to communicate through tension and struggle. I hope you'll go to that. If you're not already signed up, we will make room for you. John chapter 17, we are continuing today. These final public prayer words of Jesus, except for a few words he's gonna say on the cross. He's gonna say, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He's gonna say it is finished. But Jesus has prayed a long prayer through John 16 and 17. He's prayed it publicly, he even told his disciples, I'm saying this out loud. It's a prayer between me and the Father, but I want you to hear it because the things I'm saying are very important for you to know. And he's finishing this prayer up. He's, He's going through different movements of this prayer. But finally, he's getting to the end of this prayer, and then he's about to go to the cross. John chapter 17, continuing today and finishing this prayer in verse 20. Jesus said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you love them. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you. I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. This prayer has some really unusual phrases. It, it should be unusual for us. We're having the Son of God pray to the God the Father. We're getting led into an intimate new moment of prayer. So there are some things that are not easily understood by us, and the Spirit of God helps us understand them as we look at Scripture, comparing Scripture together, and see what Jesus is saying here. He's saying some profound things that if we believe them, would change the way we live, would change our life, change the way we feel about ourselves, the way we understand how God feels about us, the way we understand our purpose in this world. Look at what Jesus says first, verse 20. 
My prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. Jesus has just finished what we studied last week, praying for believers, praying for me and you. He prayed for people who already believe in him. He prayed some things for us. Essentially, he prayed that we would really love each other, that we would learn how to forgive each other, that we would stay committed to each other, that we would give each other a lot of grace, that we would really meet each other's needs, we'd help each other grow in our faith. All the things the scripture talks about, Jesus says, I want you to be one. And now he's shifted from praying for the church, believers, he shifted to pray for unbelievers. And he says, I'm praying for the people who believe in me now, and then I'm praying for the people who will believe in me later through their message, through the message of the believers. Jesus is praying for people who don't know Jesus. There are different words for, to describe people who don't know Jesus. The world is often used. Sometimes it's used to describe like uh, creation, but usually it's used to describe the world, like all the people in the world who are separated from God. Sometimes a word is used to describe people who don't know Jesus as lost, like people who are lost. Sometimes it would be unsaved. These are all words that the Bible uses, so we'll keep using them to describe people who are disconnected, who are not reconciled back to God. And Jesus said, I'm praying for them, the people who one day will believe through their message, through the message that we as believers share with them, that's how they'll believe. It's really wild. I mean, Jesus here is, is giving us something that we didn't even ask for. He, he's anticipating He's expecting, maybe he's even giving us this, assigning this to us, that you are the ones who are gonna carry this message. What is the message? Jesus said, I pray for those who will believe through their message. What's the message? If you're a believer, a follower of Jesus, Jesus is saying, I've given you the message to carry and there are gonna be people who believe through your message. Romans chapter one, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, the gospel. What's the gospel? It's God saving the world by his grace. Another verse that helps define it even more clearly, your message and my message, 2 Corinthians chapter five, verse 19. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. The message that God wants to send to the world through us. It's not that God hates the world, that God condemns you. The message is that God wants to reconcile you to himself. God wants to take your sins that you committed against him and he wants to not count them against you. He wants to remove them from you. He wants to put them on Jesus instead. This is the message of the gospel that you've been given because you believed in it and it affected you. It affected your entire eternity and it started to change your life. And then when you came into Christ, you also came into this mission. And the mission is the message. Like you have a purpose. Some people are saying, I, I don't really know why I continue to live here. Uh, over the past several weeks and even a couple of months, I was talking to another friend of mine this week who pastors a large church in Houston. He was saying the same thing is happening in his church. It seems to be that way all the time. I mean, there's been elevated uh, deaths and diagnoses and conversations about divorce. I mean, it just seems like there's a swell of things right now happening. And, you know, why are we here? Yeah, there's beauty and there's brokenness. And, but Jesus is saying, no, th there's a message that you've been given and this is your ministry. A lot of times I have people ask me, hey, what's my ministry? What should I do? I, I, I don't think God's going to give you a ministry until you first start doing the ministry that you already know he gave you. And that ministry is reconciling people to God through this message, helping people who are far from God get close to God. Because most people don't wake up thinking God loves them. Most people wake up knowing, look at what I've done. I am guilty. How could God love me? But when people hear from somebody who's already believed this message and received this message, when people hear, wow, God wants to not count my sins against me. God wants to give me his grace and his love. That's a good message. Yeah. <clears throat> I was waiting on you to clap because I need to put a cough drop in my mouth. But the clap didn't last long enough. So why don't you pray for like 30 seconds. Yeah. Keep praying. Just pray a little bit longer. Some of you are like, this is the longest I've prayed in a long time. 
and get my throat coated with the mouth drop. All right, let's go. And then we must know how to share this message. It's been assigned to you. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's not that you say, okay, I'll do it. It's been given to you. He didn't ask. He didn't say, do you want to be a part of my mission? It's part of the package. I come into Christ. I come into his mission of sharing his message with the world. You have a mission to share his message with the world. And some of us would be like, I know I'm not good at it. I, I know I need to get better. You're missing out on living. You're missing out on joy. You're missing out on purpose. You're missing out on life. Statistically, overwhelmingly, most of us who call ourselves Christians, we never talk to people about Jesus who don't know Jesus. That's why here we have this thing called good God gospel. We're just trying to help you over and over learn how to have good conversations with people that at some point will turn into a God conversation. Like you can't have a God conversation with somebody if you can't first have a good one. So we just start loving people and caring about people and talking to them about their life. And at some point, we bring God into it. And if we've had a good conversation with them, they may trust us to have a God conversation. If they're willing to talk about God, we bring the gospel into it. Good God gospel. My daughter Emma is in Arizona for a few days. Some uh, girl she uh, grew up with at church here and another girl, uh, one lives in Arizona, one lives in another place. They all went there for her birthday. So they're there, and my daughter Emma texts me. She's like, Dad, I just landed, but on the plane, I had a good God gospel conversation. And I'm like, you're 19, that's awesome. I wish I would have been doing that when I was 19. So I missed out on so much. I just missed so many opportunities. And now my greatest joy is having gospel conversations with people. I pray for it. I ask God to give them to me. I'm looking for it. Jesus is praying for you. And for me, he's praying for the people who are gonna believe in him through our message. There's no other way. It's not gonna happen. You go to places I'll never go to. You're gonna be somewhere today and tomorrow and the next day with people who don't know me and they don't know the, know the people sitting around you, in front of you or behind you. But you're in an office and you're in an airplane and you're in a neighborhood and you're in a place where people need to know Jesus and that's why you're there. So Jesus is praying for the people who are gonna believe in him through the message that he gave you. We gotta get good at that. We gotta get better. I pray that all of us will be evangelists. All of us will be missionaries. I mean, the video on the screen of some people from our church who are about to go to the other side of the world with their kids to share the gospel in a difficult place. I mean, that's, they're taking the same message over there that we have to share here. Some of us will go, but most of us will stay. And those of us who stay, we're here to support those who go and to share the message here where we live. This is what we're doing. Yeah? Let's do it. Let's go. Who are you praying for? Who do you care about? Who's breaking your heart? Who are you inviting into conversations? Who are you pressing into good stuff in their life with? Who have you brought to church? Who have you taken to your house church to meet other Christians? Who in your life? It's you. Jesus is praying for the people who will hear the message through you. He said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. In verse 21, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Jesus again prays for unity. I mean, he spent a long time praying about it. Now he shifts to lost people, unsaved people, people who have not been reconciled to God, and then he goes back and mentions, hey, the people with the message, I really pray for them that they'll be one. And then Jesus analogizes. Jesus says, I want them to be one, just like you and I are one. He analogizes the unity of the Trinity with the unity that he wants us to have. And all of this now is under the umbrella of our mission. Like, somehow the mission of evangelism and us carrying this message is tied to our unity together. Like us being united to one another somehow affects our ability to share the message. You know, we, we've grown in a dark cave of unity. You know, the great philosophers would talk about how somebody would be born in a cave and then they'll come out and there's things about the world that don't make sense to them because they've never seen it. For us, we've grown up in places that 
we don't really understand the gravity of unity. I, I mean, there's so many great churches around here. I think it's one of the reasons why we're continually voted one of the best communities in America to live in. I say Christ and capitalism has made the Woodlands great. <laughs> we have great churches here. Great capitalism too. And so we have great churches here. And so we don't really need to understand the gravity of unity because we're like, you know, hey, if I don't like something or something's changed for me or if something has changed in a relationship with some people here, then what I can do is I can just go find one of the other great, you know, 10 great mega churches. I can go find these other places or now I don't want big, I want small. Or now I don't want small, I want big. Or now I just want medium, whatever that is. I'm going to this and that. And we go find our place and we just sort of go. And when, when the early church was started, the idea of being disconnected from community was so big that they would give up sin to stay in the community. That's where church discipline was able to happen. There's no way I'd rather get put out of this community, so I'd rather put sin out of my life than get put out of this community. So many of us are so casually connected to the church. And look, if you come sometimes and sit in a seat sometimes on a Sunday and sing some songs and listen to a sermon, I am really, really glad you're here. But I will also tell you, I think it's affecting your mission. I think it's affecting your ability to share the message. And it's affecting a church somewhere. So I'd love for you to know people's names here. People know your names and you know their needs and they know yours. And the way that we start to love each other, meet each other's needs and care for each other. I mean, Jesus just keeps praying that we'd be one. We need to be one with the body. And Jesus uses it to sanctify us, right? I'm around people who aren't like me. I'm around people who I don't even like. And I'm around people who may not like me. And we all gotta learn to love each other, forgive each other and help each other. Jesus is praying for our oneness and our oneness is somehow connected to the mission. I would encourage you to press into that. See how you're one with the body of believers and how it's affecting your mission. So we go on, because Jesus does. Verse 21, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Wow. Weird words. You're in me and I'm in you. How's that possible? Jesus super clarifies all throughout scripture what he means. His spirit will come to live inside our body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. A few verses for you to understand that he's in you. The spirit of Jesus is in you. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse 22. He set his seal of ownership on us and he put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit. Romans chapter five, verse 11. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. Jesus here over and over says, they are in us and we are in them. I was in college and um, I was in Wilson dorm, room 311. It's not there anymore, they tore it down. They should have torn it down before I lived in it, it was horrible. Uh, you could never get the linoleum tile floors uh, clean, it was nasty. My roommate wasn't a believer, I didn't know anybody at this school, and so uh, I spent a lot of time reading my Bible. And I remember I was reading through Romans, and I got to this verse, Romans 5.11. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. I just stopped. And I thought, well, I, I think theologically I, I get that, but practically, actually, do I, do I really think that the spirit, of, the spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead is living in me. And I started pursuing understanding this more, believing it more, living as if it were true more. I started changing my life. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. And here at Jesus' last public prayer, before he goes to the cross, in this next chapter, his last public prayer, public prayer he says over and over, we are going to be in them. I'm gonna put myself, my nature, my spirit is going to be in you. Jesus, his spirit indwells our spirit. And then, look if you will, read with me, go on, verse 22. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one, he says it again, as we are one. I and them, and you and me, he says it again. May they be brought to complete unity, he says it again. To let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you love me, he again 
tied unity to the mission. And then verse 24, Father, I want those that you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Father, I want those that you have given me, I want them to be with me. As we grow in our relationship with Jesus, something starts to change in our heart. When we start to love him more, and we would rather be with him than be here. Now sometimes we wanna be with Jesus more because we wanna be away from the brokenness more. I mean, the more pain you've endured, the more brokenness you're around, the more you see that this world will never fully satisfy you, it leads us, it connects to something in our heart, that there's more than this world can offer me. I'll never be fully satisfied here. But there's something more than just wanting to be away from the world that causes us to wanna to be with Jesus. Like our love for him grows, and we, more than we wanna be away from here, we wanna be with him. But sometimes I neglect to realize that Jesus actually wants to be with me. Like I live with this sense of almost a pressure, a spiritual pressure, that I need to want, to want to be with Jesus. I need to be growing in my desire to be with Jesus. I need to love Jesus more than the world, true. But I often forget that Jesus actually wants to be with me more than I can ever want to be with him. I mean, the Bible says that he's like a bridegroom, like a groom who's betrothed to a bride and he can't wait for his wedding day so he can go get his bride. So Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's waiting for the Father to say, son, go get your bride. That's the imagery that the Bible uses to let you know and let me know that Jesus wants to be with us. This past week, several weeks, a couple of months, I've had a lot of people talking about what are these signs that we're seeing, right? Like red heifers and eclipses and Hamas and now last night I ran with Israel and people are like, does this mean Jesus is getting ready to come back? I'm like, I hope so, I hope so. One of two, I mean, the Bible says some of these things are gonna start happening, but then some people live with this anxiety of, what if I miss it? What if I get it wrong? What if I don't have all the signs right? What if I miss something? And I'm like, look, you can't miss Jesus' return because he misses you so much already, and he's not gonna miss you when he comes back. You can't miss his return. He misses you more than you could ever miss him. He loves you more than you could ever love him. First John 4, 19, we love him because he loved us first. So when Jesus is praying to his father, it's like a son talking to his dad about his greatest love in this life. And he says to the father, I mean, this is about us. We're getting to read this love letter, like this private prayer conversation, getting to hear what the son thinks about us. He's sharing with his father. He says, father, I want those that you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory that you've given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Like, I can't wait to be with them. I have so much to show them. So many more glorious things than they'll ever see in the creation of this world. I can't wait for them to be with me. That's how Jesus thinks about you. And we're gonna get to Jesus in one of two ways. We're gonna get there through his return. Maybe it's soon. But those things don't cause us anxiety. They're there for our encouragement. A sign of the end of the time in the Bible is only there for our encouragement, not for anxiety, not for our super investigation. It's for our encouragement to let us know God's still in control. He's already predicted and prophesied these things. Jesus is gonna come back soon. Be encouraged. Don't be worried. Don't become an investigator. Be encouraged by these things. But Jesus is also saying to you, I have some things to show you that you'll never be able to see in this world. Father, I want him with me. I don't know if this is the last time Jesus asked, if he asked the Father a lot. I don't know if he's quietly, patiently waiting next to the Father, but he's asking the Father right here, I want those that you've given me to be with me. Like he's even talking about his disciples right here. I don't wanna leave them. I want them to come with me. I mean, I wanna be with you, Father, in heaven, but I wanna bring them with me because that's how much I love them. Jesus loves you. I don't, I don't know what it's gonna take for you to get to the place to where you really believe 
that Jesus loves you. I don't know what it's gonna take, but for me, it's a prayer. It's a constant pursuit. I pray for other people. I wanna believe this verse. Like, I wanna feel it. I want it to affect me. Father, I want those you've given me to be with me. I wanna show my glory. Jesus loves you. And then finally, he closes this out. Look at this, verse 25. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you sent me. Father, the world doesn't know you. The world does not know you. These people who aren't followers of me, they don't know you. People who are not believers in Jesus and followers of Jesus, they don't know the Father. The world does not know you, Jesus just said here. I think sometimes we as Christians though, we forget the world does not know God. And we as Christians sometimes, we I think contaminate the gospel, we distort the gospel by expecting the world to live like those of us who follow Jesus. I mean it's an abuse of grace to say look, look at how I live. I think the whole world should live the way I live. The only reason you live the way you live for Jesus is by his grace. There was some point in your life where Jesus stepped in and he interrupted the path you were on. And some of us were like, I was really young. I didn't do a lot of bad stuff. You would have. If Jesus hadn't stepped in and saved you, you would have. You weren't good enough. You weren't born with a tilt toward God. You weren't born, born with a tilt toward submitting yourself to God. No, your nature was elevating self over God. But God, by his grace, stepped in and saved you. And he made our hearts submit to him. And now we have a new nature in Jesus. And now we naturally wanna follow Jesus. And so when we sin, we step outside of his will, we're not doing things his ways, his spirit convicts us. That's a sign that we are followers of Jesus. How in the world should we expect the world to not live like the world? The world will live like the world because they do not know God. And one of the things that embarrasses me the most associating with Christianity in America is when Christians expect the world to live like a Christian. And it lets me know, hey, you person who expects the world to live like a Christian, you don't understand grace. The only way that you live for Jesus is by his grace, not by your goodness. Jesus says here, the world does not know you, but I know you. And the people that follow me, they know you. And Jesus says in verse 24, I've made you known to them. I'll continue to make you known to them in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Jesus finishes up, finishes up this prayer with love. That the love that you have for me, it may be in them. We're not natural lovers. We're actually natural enemies. We're enemies with God and we're we're enemies with each other. It goes back to the first family. I mean, murder in the first family. We're, we're enemies with God. Here's what the Bible says. Romans 5, 10, while we were God's enemies. Like we were against God. We were against God's ways. We were against God's will. We still feel it. We still wanna go our own way. We were against God. We're his enemy. We're enemies with other people. I mean, we hate, we fight, we steal, we kill, we covet, the Bible says, all these things. The only way that we can have love is Jesus said, look, I mean, he said in this verse, in order that the love that you have for them may be in them, like God's love would be in us. Now we would start loving God. Now we would start loving other people. And now really we would start loving self. We even distort the view of loving ourselves. We think that loving self means I gotta be beautiful, I gotta be wealthy, I gotta be powerful, I gotta be popular. We think that loving self means all these things, but that's not what loving ourself is. And so we've even distorted loving ourself until we get to a point to where we realize, no, I, I know how much God loves me and his love is in me. And so now I can love God, I was his enemy. Now I can love other people, I was against them, I'm for them now. I care about people now. I did a little digging into this. There is an exception. I looked at the amplified version of the message. When you're in your car, it, that doesn't apply. You don't have to love people when you're in your car. When you're surrounded by steel and glass and rubber, you're exempt. 
from God's love being in you. It was very comforting for me to study that in the Bible this week and use a lot of flexibility to get to that point to where I now give myself freedom to not love people while I'm in my car. But beyond that, God's love would be in us. And we do excuse ourselves from loving people, certain types of people, certain behaviors. The world doesn't know God. The only way that we could love the world is because God loves the world and his love is now in us. And now we're loving God and we're loving other people and we're especially loving the body. And we even can love ourselves because God's love's in us now. Would you stand with me as we reflect on these things and respond? As we do every week, I'll give you just a moment to be still and consider what you will do with what you have heard. People will believe through people who believe. You've been committed to the message. The message is your mission. Maybe today you would say, God, I am. I have excused myself from being a messenger. Jesus today reminds me that you anticipated that I would take this message that I believed and I would give it to those who don't believe. I will no longer excuse myself because you do not. I will no longer exempt myself from this part of my salvation because you do not. I do ask you to help me grow. Show me what to do. I'll pursue this, I'll pray. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is in you. Follower of Jesus, maybe for a moment you would just say, God, would you help me understand this reality that your spirit is living inside of me? and what that means for me. Jesus wants us to be with him even more than we want to be with him. Maybe today you'd say, would, you, would this change the way I see myself, the way I feel? that you actually want to be with me, Jesus, even more than I want to be with you. Are you a Christian and you've expected the world to live like you? You've distorted grace. You've contaminated the free gift of grace that has caused you to live for Jesus. Maybe today you would say, forgive me for the expectations that I put on the world to live the way I live. Thank you for your grace in my life. Finally, maybe you're here today. And yeah, you've heard about Jesus, but you've never gotten to this moment to where it all clicked. It all made sense. I am a sinner. I am separated from God. And Jesus came to reconcile me to God. This is the day where the Bible says it's the day of your salvation. That's why you're here. That's why you've been feeling the things and sensing the things and talking about the things forever long up to this moment. This is the moment. The Bible says in John 1, whoever believed in him, whoever received him, he gave the right to become a child of God. Today you can believe in Jesus and receive him. Today you can say, Jesus, I, I believe in you. I believe that you are who you say you are. You're God who became a man who lived and died and rose again to pay for my sin. I believe in you and I receive you. I am a sinner and you offer me salvation. I receive it. Jesus, thank you for letting us walk through for weeks this prayer, this beautiful prayer. Thank you that you let us know even in your prayer how much you love us. Thank you that you reminded us that this message is ours from you to the world. And I pray that we would share it. I pray we would all become missionaries. We'd all become evangelists. We don't grow in this. 
we'd all experience the greater joy of having gospel conversations with people. She said, I pray that we would love people well. We love you. We pray all this in your great name.